Okay, well, good to go. Hey, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for this opportunity to to uh, talk to you this morning. Uh, it's certainly a great privilege for us as funeral directors in our community to to have the opportunity to come to you live on uh, on Facebook um, and uh, talk to you around um, what what uh, COVID nineteen uh, the impact that that's had on our business in the Hutt Valley. Um, firstly, we'd just like to acknowledge uh, our relationship with the Chamber of Commerce that um, we're platinum partners with the Chamber and uh, you know, we really do appreciate um, the benefits and, and the, the, um, the opportunity to be uh, members of the Chamber. I think it's a, it's a fantastic um, um, organisation to belong to. My name's Gavin Murphy and I'm the General Manager at uh, Jan Hickton Funeral Directors and, and Cassie's uh, sitting uh, with me here. So she's one of our Funeral Directors and Embalmers. And uh, look, we're uh, more than happy to take as many questions as you have this morning. So uh, we want it to be as, inf as, uh, as informative uh, as we can for you. So just uh, put those um, questions up on the screen and we're more than happy to, to answer those. Probably a good place to start for us is uh, how this, this all rolled out for us last Wednesday and uh, we were obviously deemed uh, an, an essential care service and, uh, and we had to sort of sit back um, prior to that and say what, what did that mean for us as a business and uh, how did we um, endeavour to respond to that requirement. Um, so as I say, being, being part of a, um, a central service meant that we had to continue operating or needed to continue operating. Obviously, we're in um, the funeral, funeral business and uh, the government had been talking um, numbers of up to 18,000 deaths occurring during uh, the time of, of COVID. Um, so we had to start planning about what that looked like for us. And um, we also had some guidelines coming from the Ministry of Health around uh, what we were able to do as far as any viewings or gatherings or funerals. And uh, as I say, that, that changed probably on a daily basis and uh, we yeah. had to uh, just start looking at um, what that looked like. So the first thing we had to look at was um, how did we maintain business continuity? And uh, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that uh, if one of the staff uh, did um, become unwell, um, that uh, they were um, that that actually didn't bring bring the business to to a halt. So we actually had a couple of staff who uh, chose to self isolate um, uh, because of uh, one because of um, uh, her maturity and the other because of um, uh, some some underlying health um, concerns. And so we're obviously uh, very respectful of that, and and they were able to go and self isolate. Um, so that brought a, our team of 20 back to, to 18 um, and uh, as I say then we had to look, turn our minds to how we, we covered uh, um, a 24 hour a day, 7 day a week business with 18 people and um, obviously <clears throat> at that time uh, and potentially still the, the number of deaths ramping up significantly um, over the next uh, month to two months. So what we did was uh, split off into bubbles, um, we, we formed four bubbles uh, and um, those people are only allowed to work together at a particular time. So um, when uh, one bubble's in, the other three are either working, uh, well, they are working remotely or coming in after the other bubble has finished. And as I say, the rationale behind that was to ensure that, um, uh, that we didn't have the whole staff going down or one person getting, getting, becoming unwell and, and um, the whole business uh, grinding to a halt. Yeah, and it also just allowed us to limit the amount of people in the office and things as well. So, especially when we had families coming in at this point before the complete lockdown. So, yeah. and to maintain social distancing, which is quite challenging on the screen at the moment. So, <laughs> um, we are in the same bubble. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing was um, around um, the background planning, as I say, for for eighteen thousand deaths potentially. Uh, currently in New Zealand there's about 38,000 deaths and so the modelling um, anticipated that those 38,000 deaths would um, continue but uh, on top of that there's potentially another 18,000 deaths that, that would occur. So um, the planning that went in around that was um, one where we, how would we do the transfers and where would we store people's loved ones. Um, and how would we actually facilitate making arrangements around whatever type of uh, memorial gathering or things the uh, Ministry of Health were allowing at the time. 
So we ended up um, through um, uh, the government authorities having uh, three phase power installed in, in the funeral homes. Um, and that was is an, in anticipation if uh, deaths did ramp up that uh, refrigerated containers um, are placed at the funeral home. And uh, it was just because the modelling um, envisaged the sheer, a sheer number of um, deaths that were occurring that our current facilities wouldn't um, wouldn't uh, facilitate um, storing those those people. And this this is quite usual um, when. Um, math, mass deaths occur. So we've, we've seen um, it uh, after the Christchurch earthquakes, for instance, that this is the, the most appropriate way of storing um, storing the deceased until they're released to the funeral home. Yeah. The other things that we had to talk about um, was um, around uh, what, what was the service offering and uh, what was available for families to... Um, uh, to, to celebrate the life. Obviously, as, as Kiwis, we're very familiar with uh, funeral services. And um, there was, uh, as I say, the guidelines were changing on a daily basis. So we were having to, to replan. And, I think and that made it very difficult for our, our staff as well as the families we were looking after, especially because we'd go and see them one day and we'd transfer their loved one into our care and... With, like at one point we weren't allowed any viewings as such and so we'd let the families know and then the next day we were allowed viewings and things which is obviously great and gives the family a chance to say goodbye but it was definitely hard on everyone involved with the constant change and no one really knew, um, especially in the first week or so, no one really knew what we could and couldn't um, do. So, And we definitely felt for those um, people who got caught in the, between the um, the change of, of, of yeah. the guidelines so one day they, they weren't allowed to view but the next day they were and obviously we'd, we'd cremated some loved ones um, on the Monday and on the Monday night they, the plans chose So and we just had um, absolutely no warning in yeah. regards to that changing either so yeah it was definitely hard and the way we receive our updates is, is the way the public receive their updates as well. So, you know, we're having to watch the Ministry of Health guidelines and, and they're released on there and then um, uh, they're picked up by either FDANZ or NZDA, which are industry bodies, um, and, and circulated. So we can either watch the um, watch the website for updates or uh, wait till they come out from... Um, come out from uh, the minister, uh, from either NZDA or FDANZ. Okay, so let's uh, just have a look where we're at now. Um, I think that's uh, what, what most people are interested in. Um, you know, we've got probably, hopefully, only another two weeks till um, lockdown's lifted uh, and we can get back to normal. And I think one of the things that we've seen um, is that people have really missed that opportunity to have a funeral. And I think going into this, people have, you know, would often ring us and say, oh, I'm not sure that we want a funeral or, you know, we might just have a straight cremation and do something later on. And it's been really interesting now that that opportunity's more taken or less been away. taken away. Yeah, that um, that people are really wanting it. So, um, so I think um, you know it's uh, it's interesting around you know when we don't have it, we we, we do want it. And, yeah, um, I think it's the public and our community have just gained an appreciation for the value of a funeral and what it actually means. I guess. When it's your option, if you want to or you don't want to, it's quite easy to make that call. Well, not easy, obviously, but it's a bit different. And then as soon as there is no option and we can't have funerals, people are like, well, how do I say goodbye? And it is taking a toll on families because of that. Um, so, yeah, I think they've just started to realise what we actually do and the value of what we do for their loved one. Mm, yeah, thanks, guys. So, so where are we at now? Um, we've got, um, obviously, um, viewings can take place uh, only if, if people are uh, within the bubble. Um, so what we're able to do now is transfer from the place of death back to the funeral home. Um, those who were part of the bubble are able to come in and, um, and spend some time with their loved one. Um, the number of people that can come in are obviously restricted to those who were in the bubble, so the number of, of people there. And that's of the deceased bubble as well. So. That's right, yeah. yeah. And the other thing was about the size of the room. So there's, a, there's a, some guidance that's provided around the, the size of the room and, and um, a calculation about how many people then should be uh, in that room to, to maintain social distancing and things. So, 
Um, so there's that. Our families can come in and view. Uh, if they want to now, they can attend the burial, and obviously most people want to do that, um, or attend the crematorium, but, but there's doing no funeral services. So, And again, that's with this, within the same bubble of people, so we um, unfortunately still can't have clergy or celebrants or anything in attendance. There is the option of um, live streaming or having a clergy or celebrant over the phone, um, which is really good, but yeah, they can't attend the burial or cremation. Yeah, so um, so we've got got those options. Um, we obviously do have, um, you know, we have, you know, in the, the entire funeral industry really, um, and we're particularly lucky uh, at Jan Higton to have some fantastic embalmers. Um, so um, long-term embalming, what we term long-term embalming, gives families options as well. For instance, we had a family yesterday who uh, their, their loved one died, who then said to us, hey, look, we want to wait till we get out of uh, lockdown four, um, and then we'll have a funeral service. Um, so, you know, that's very easy for us to facilitate and um, and that we can embalm their loved one. So as soon as lockdown's finished, and it's hopefully two to week, two weeks, could be slightly, slightly longer, um, that um, they can then come in and view and have their... their um, uh, funeral services as they ordinarily would have had. Uh, some families are electing to have um, either a, a private burial or private cremation up front and then a memorial service uh, later on. And uh, again, uh, we're just uh, keeping in contact and keeping close to those families and going uh, that once we're out of uh, lockdown four, um, that um, they can then have um, the ashes back and, and perhaps a nice urn and, and then a memorial service take place in one of our chapels or in the church or um, somewhere where they're, um, um, they're, where they're comfortable. I think as well, um, just with embalming, I guess, with everything changing so fast as well, um, if, if we do choose to embalm and look after them in our care for a the duration of the lockdown, it does give the families that aren't in the bubble an opportunity to come in and say goodbye once lockdown has been lifted or once they've changed, if they do change any guide, guidelines again. So it is a very important um, thing and it is something we're offering to all families if that's what they choose to take up. So. Okay, so is uh, anyone got any questions? I haven't seen any questions pop up on the screen. Um, uh, it's probably the wrap from us, although you know we do, uh, as I say, we're, we're more than happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. So um, uh, I guess the only other thing was just to um, to recap around that um, staying at home, you know, and, and it seems to be working that uh, pleasingly in the Hutt Valley that there's been, um, I understand, no admissions to Lower Hutt Hospital, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and um, and no evidence thus far of community trans transmission in the Hutt Valley, so um, which is a, which again is a um, fantastic uh, result because I know that there's uh, lots of businesses out there that are absolutely hurting through all this, um, and uh, you know we're we're probably fortunate in that we've been deemed a, um, a, an essential service and that you have actually some uh, revenue coming through, uh, but for those other businesses who've had to to close down for four weeks, you um, definitely. Um, uh, definitely feel for them. So, uh, I think we need to uh, say, uh, do this together, and um, you know, hopefully, we can all get back to um, back to uh, everything uh, following that. So, yeah, there is just a question in regards to once lockdown is over, how will funerals work in regards to only being able to have gatherings with less than a hundred people? So, once level four is lifted. Presumably we will go to level three again, which was with gatherings less than 100 people. So when that was implemented, we were um, just preparing ourselves and we, our chapels um, seat different amounts of people. So we looked into that and um, we were just going to separate people on the pews and things and just make sure that no more than 100 people were in a chapel at once with obviously social distancing in between. Um, we also do have facilities outside for people to stand if it is for a larger funeral and we can always um, have some screens outside and things and s stream the service onto the screens outside which people will then be able to watch. So. 
Yeah, thanks, Kessie. Um, so, look, uh, you know, we've got no idea what the guidelines going to look like uh, once we get out of this. Um, I, I look, I think it's going to take some time. I you know, heard a quote the other day about um, you know it's not going to be like turning a light switch on. It's going to be very much like uh, warming warming an oven. You know, for for businesses to sort of start understanding what the parameters are that they're having to operate in and. Um, and again, you know, we, we're not immune to that. So we're going to be um, obviously talking with the Ministry of Health and understanding uh, as an industry what, what the implications are for us. So, um, yeah. Okay, well, that, uh, that looks like... Um, no more questions here, Cassie, that I can see. <laughs> Didn't put your glasses on. <laughs> um, so if anyone does have any questions and they'd like to ask them privately, we are available... So feel free to contact us on 04566 3103 or through our Facebook page. I will be able to respond to you directly through Facebook if you do have any questions. Um, but yeah, we're happy to take any questions and obviously be very open and transparent with you. So, yeah. Yep, and also at uh, gnhickton.co.nz on, on the web. Um, so come and have a look there. Uh, so what we're doing is, uh, as soon as updates uh, come through, we're updating both the uh, Facebook page and the website. So, um, but we get we're getting lots of telephone inquiries as well. So if anyone has any uh, telephone inquiries that they'd like to uh, talk to someone, a human being on the other end, hey, just uh, give us a call and uh, we'd be more than happy to answer those queries for you. Thanks, folks. Have a great day. See ya.